Uh, and so I remember I would drive to youth group, smoking in my car, getting there and just putting on the body deodorant and walking in there and teaching them about the Bible. And because I knew the Bible really, really well, but I didn't know the author very well. But when I went to go see him, he was, um, from the moment he opened his door, he was just completely, like his face was transformed. And um, that whole weekend was spent where he was just sharing with me about what Jesus had done in his life. And I just thought, um, this is the most ridiculous thing. And I just remember just kind of mocking and making fun of him. Um, he took me into the, the main church sanctuary and they're having overnight prayer. And I'll never forget this, that he uh, asked me to just sit in the back row and he went up to the front of the church and he, um, he, uh, he fell at the altar and he was just, um, sorry, he was just, started crying out to God for me. In order to, you know, the, the pastor who had invited me, I, I went up to him, I said, I, I, he probably never had a, a speaker like this before. I said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. And I said, here. <laughs> and I gave him the mic. I remember. But it took me a while to realize that what God was saying to me was that he was saying, son, I know how much you want revival. I know how much you're longing for a move and awakening. He said, but you're never going to get it by just preaching about it. Okay, Pastor Paul, take us back to your childhood. How did you meet God? Uh, I was raised in a, um, in a Christian home where uh, my parents uh, took us to church every Sunday. So I uh, never missed church ever. And so it was just part of my upbringing. And uh, later on in my parents' lives, while they're in their 50s actually, God called, um, called them into the ministry. And so we went from being a typical Asian American family living in Silicon Valley to all of a sudden losing all of our homes that we owned and going into ministry and eventually landing in Sacramento. And so I was in my high school uh, freshman year and it was such a radical change for us to do that. The church thing was normal, but the ministry thing was really different. And so. You know, when you go in the ministry, it's usually a family endeavor of that size. And so I volunteered and I helped with worship. I helped with everything my parents needed. And uh, eventually I ended up helping with the youth group. And so I, I became the uh, youth leader of a very small group of kids. It was maybe like different times, five to 10 high school kids. And um, the funny thing was, is that I wasn't even saved. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even really have a real relationship with God. I was just someone that knew a lot about him. And, uh, but I was in that period of my life. Um, this is now probably when I'm in my college years that I, I became the youth leader. Uh, and so I remember I would drive to youth group, smoking in my car, and then um, getting there and just putting on the body deodorant and walking in there and teaching them about the Bible. And because I knew the Bible really, really well, but I didn't know the author very well. Uh, and so that was kind of like my upbringing, my initial years um, growing up in the church, um, but it was at the age of 20 when my best friend called me up and he told me that he had had, um, he had met Jesus and he told me that he needed to see me. He lived in San Jose, I lived in Sacramento. And I thought this was the most ridiculous thing because he was actually um, someone that was raised up in the Catholic church and he you know, he knew less about God than I did. I mean, I was the one that would always 
you know, correct him and, you know, his, uh, whatever his thoughts were about God. But he was now calling me and telling me that I needed to come see him. And I remember I, I um, went down there more to just hang out with him, um, thinking that it would be like our old, you know, every time that I'd go down and we'd get into our shenanigans and do all <laughs> kinds of stuff. But when I went to go see him, he was, um, from the moment he opened his door, he was just completely, like his face was transformed. And um, that whole weekend was spent where he was just sharing with me about what Jesus had done in his life. And I just thought, um, this is the most ridiculous thing. And I just remember just kind of mocking and making fun of him. Um, took me to his college group where he had met God, encountered God. And remember after that night, uh, it started at 10 o'clock the Friday night. It's such a weird time for a college group to meet. But after it was over, he took me into the, the main church sanctuary and they were having overnight prayer. And I'll never forget this, that he uh, asked me to just sit in the back row and he went up to the front of the church and he, um, he, uh, he fell at the altar and he was just, um, sorry, he was just, started crying out to God for me. And it was, a, it was a darkened room, and I remember there was very few people in there, but I remember being so odd to see my friend up there um, just crying out to, to God. And I, didn't, I knew, like, this is something I didn't understand. I mean, I knew church, and I knew everything, but I didn't understand this. And so uh, he, uh, you know, even at that, though, my, my heart was still kind of like I was just trying to resist resist my friend out of pride and resist God. But at the end of that week, and I was, um, I remember he was really, I know he was disappointed that I hadn't opened myself up. But as I was driving back up to Sacramento from San Jose, it was a charge drive. I was on the freeway and I, um, it's like my heart was like burning and I couldn't resist anymore. And I just said, God, I, I just want what, what Rick has. That's my friend's name. I said, I just, I said, I don't know if you're real, but I said, I just want what he has. And it was right there in that moment, it felt like, like my, you know, God popped my head open and just poured uh, liquid love, you know? I don't know, I'd never felt anything like that before, where from, you know, my entire body was consumed with this love. And I started weeping so hard, uncontrollably, that I had to pull over to the side of the freeway, and I'm just sobbing there for like 15, 20 minutes, experiencing a love that I'd never known before. And um, that, was, that, was, uh, that was the beginning, you know. It, it was the beginning of my journey with God. And, and uh, soon after that, I took my kids to a retreat. And, you know, we were all I, I, filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, it just began this incredible journey with God. And um, it, was, it was just an amazing season, an amazing time. And so... Um, did that ministry. It was a very challenging ministry. Um, I had a lot of kids. The youth group grew. Um, I mean, it wasn't big. It was like 20 to 30 kids. But most of my kids were um, involved in gangs and, you know, and, and different kinds of stuff and just broken homes. And so there was a lot of real broken ministry with them. And uh, it, it uh, was overwhelming for me. And um, But at the end of uh, about five years into it, I felt the Lord just leading me to come down um, to get, it was actually my parents, and I just, they said they wanted me to go to seminary, because if you're Korean, you have to go to seminary if you want to do ministry, because that's the only way you can do real ministry is to get a seminary degree. So I, I didn't resist. It wasn't so much I was interested in the seminary degree. I just needed a break because <laughs> <laughs> ministry was so challenging and so hard. So I moved down here, came down to Fuller, and went to school and uh, got my degree and um, met my wife there. And uh, we got married and um, stepped out of ministry uh, after that, because for a couple of years, because um, God told me that he um, wanted to deal with some of the issues inside. Um, 
I had a lady who said this to me. She took me aside before that. She gave me, pulled me aside, and gave me a prophetic word. And she said, Paul, she said, God's going to take you out for a season. And you, um, you have a tumor growing inside of you. It's a spiritual tumor. He says, unless God, you allow God to deal with it, it's going to continue to grow. And it will explode one day and, and kill you. And she's talking, I'm assuming, spiritually, not like literally. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill your family. It's going to kill your ministry. So you have to let God deal with it. So, and I was, I was already planning after I got married to step out of ministry. And so I, I did, and I got a regular job, and I, I got a teaching job in a public school in Rosemead, California. Um, started teaching high school English. Um, I still am teaching high school English to this day. That was 25 years ago. Um, and um, I, I wasn't doing regular church ministry, but I was doing I, a lot of itinerant ministry throughout the year. So I'd travel to churches and I'd do retreats and I'd speak at revivals for youth groups and college groups. Um, and uh, my one of the themes for me uh, for what God always put on my heart was about revival. Because I was, I, I didn't know it then, but when my friend um, led me to the Lord, there was a, a move of God that was happening um, in Northern California. Actually, I learned it was happening really all throughout California. And um, there was like an awakening happening among Asian Americans throughout California. And so I was saved and, and filled with the Holy Spirit and in a time where uh, I saw a youth that were so passionate for God and most radical sinners get saved. And to me, that was the norm. And so when the revival and the awakening began to kind of ebb and you began to see it's, it's began to slow down, um, it left in me a longing for that because that had become the standard and the norm mm. to have people passionate for Jesus, to have the most radical of sinners saved and, and, and coming to the Lord. So I, I, I became almost like a, um, uh, I, I became like a, a student of revival. Like I studied it in church history and I, and I, I, and I would meditate and pray about it, and I preached about it. Almost all my messages were about revival. And I, I remember I'd go to youth groups, and I would feel at times when I was preaching about it that it was, it was right there. If, like, if, if, if I just pushed a little harder, if, if, if uh, God would come and I'd see you know, all of these young people fall on their faces before the Lord, just crying out before him. And uh, I did that for years. I can't remember how many churches I spoke at, how many messages I spoke on revival, but I went through a period after getting married where um, for years where I actually, the ministry slowed down and there was maybe several years where I, I wasn't ministering. Um, and um, I was, um, and then on uh July 11, 2005, at 7.11 in the morning, I, I woke up. This is like summer vacation for me. And so, you know, I don't set the alarm during summertime. It's the time a teacher sleep in. But I woke up on this morning, and at that time we had, you know, candy bar phones. And I picked up my phone and I, to see what time it was. And I picked up my phone, and it said 7.11. 7 11 at the top 7 11 a.m july 11 and immediately I, w I i looked at it and i felt the lord speaking to me so i got up and i walked into the living room to get a bible and uh to turn to um isaiah 7 11 which is the prophetic book that everyone looks to <laughs> or jeremiah or nehemiah one of those minor prophets or prophets and so I looked at, the first place I looked was Isaiah 7:11, and the verse was, ask the Lord for a sign. I asked him for a gift. And I knew what God was speaking to my heart. And uh, because I was invited the following month to speak at a retreat, and it was the first retreat I had 
I was being invited to after a couple of years. And um, I felt the Lord saying that at this retreat, he wanted to, for me to ask him for a sign and ask him for a gift. Because the last night of the retreat happened to fall on my birthday, which was August 18, which is also 7 plus 11 is 18. And so this is, this is how God speaks to me. He, he speaks to me a lot of times in numbers, right? So on July 11 at 7-11, he speaks to me from Isaiah 7-11 that he's going to do something on the 18th of August, the next month, which was my birthday, the last night of his retreat. And I knew, and I felt like what I knew God was going to do. He's like, you're going to do it. You're, you're going to let me see your glory. You're going to let me see and be part of a move of God and revival breaking out, God. And so I was so excited. And I was preparing for this, this retreat, which was a long retreat. It was four days and three nights, which was how many messages? I think it was like seven or eight messages I had to prepare. And so when they asked me, what's your theme for the retreat? I said, it's going to be on the coming move of God. <laughs> of course, it's going to be on revival. And so I went into this retreat and uh, I remember just being so excited about what God was going to do. No one else knew uh, what God is. I didn't share with anyone what, what God had said and what, what I felt like he was going to do. But just began to speak message after message, and every message was about revival and past and how God works through moves of God and awakenings. And it was leading up to this coming move of God about what it was going to look like. But the last night was the night, and if you're kind of into the retreat culture of churches, it's like usually it's the last night. It's the night when everyone just kind of gets their business done with God. It's like this is where the altar call you know, the big one happens and people get right with God before they go back down. And so I was waiting for this. And so the last night is there and I have the message. And um, my message is going to be about what is it that God requires of this generation that he's going to use in this coming move. And it was a message all about surrender and sacrifice. And so I was just like, all right, God. And so I went into the meeting and, um, you know, when you, after you speak a while, enough times, you kind of get a sense of like how the night is going and how it's going to go. And unfortunately for me sitting there waiting, you know, through the worship, I had this real f feeling like, like it was not going to go well. Like I couldn't feel like, I couldn't feel God. I, could, I couldn't sense his presence. I felt like very nervous. I felt very, uh, like I, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Um, but I, you know, sometimes, you know, God would meet me there as soon as I stepped on stage. Not this time. I, I walked up there and, I, and uh, I took the mic and I was just complete blank. And I remember it was just like, it was like, zero presence of God in the room, zero what we call the anointing. And I sh was struggling to get through this message that I had all prepared. And I, I remember like sometimes if it's hard for me to speak, I just get louder. And uh, I just kind of like, or if I just get louder, maybe it will like get better. But, you know, I, I just, I kept struggling. I kept getting louder and louder. And the message is all on surrender and sacrifice. So by the end of the message, I'm shouting at, at the, the young people that they need to surrender and turn from their sins and to sacrifice their lives and to give it up for the sake of, you know, God's call for them. And I, uh, I was doing it without God in the room. And uh, I came to the end of the message and I have to do the altar call. And uh, I remember just... There was just nothing there, but I, you have to do the altar call. Like, and so I invited, you know, students to come to the front if they wanted to lay down their lives and, 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 and answer in response to the call of God, of what he was going to do on the earth in the coming days. And I remember like no one came up. <laughs> it was just like, it was like the most, uh, 
anticlimactic kind of altar call because everyone just stood there. It's like no one felt conviction. There was no flooding of the altars. This was the very complete opposite of what I had anticipated this night was going to be. I'd anticipated like the Shekinah glory cloud coming into the room and every one of us falling, the musicians and the worshipers and the people falling on their face before God as, as the weight of this glory cloud filled the room. And here I am in an absolutely cold room and no one is moving at the altar call. I remember... You know, there are, at this particular retreat, all the parents and the elders and some of the visiting pastors are in the back. And they're all there praying and offering their support. But no one's moving. And I remember, like, kids are looking back there and their parents are back. They're like, <laughs> right? And so the kids would, like, turn back. And, like, <laughs> and they would just start to walk up to the front. And, like, one kid... Kind of like just, you know, opened up the floodgates and everyone starts coming up. Oh. But they're coming up not because, like, God's convicting them. They're coming up. It's like, this is what we do at a retreat. We, we come up to the front yeah. and we're going to repent and cry out to God and get right and sacrifice and all that stuff. And I remember the altar was flooded. But God's still not there. And I just started praying for a couple. It's like, maybe if I pray for them, it'll feel something. Nothing. I'm praying for like three or four kids. I'm not feeling anything. The worship's going on. They're trying to build the atmosphere and Ooh. trying to, you know, get the kids to just like respond to something. And I, I, I'm just like thinking, I'm so like thinking, what is going on? I'm just absolutely confused and, and, and just like, I don't know what to do, and and um, because because of my expectation for that night, and I remember, I uh, I ended up walking over to you know the the pastor who had invited me, and I I went up to him, I said, I, I, he probably never had a, a speaker like this before. I said, I'm so sorry, I don't know what's going on, and I said, here, <laughs> and I gave him the mic. I remember he takes the mic and he, he picks up right from where I was at because I had been calling the people to surrender at the front. But he picks up the mic and he starts taking over tag team, starts shouting at the students to repent and to get right with God and the surrender and the sacrifice. And I remember from the side uh, of the stage, I'm just kind of looking at him and I'm looking at the kids and I'm just thinking, I'm so confused. And again, I did something that probably no retreat speaker ever did is that I actually walked out. I just sl sl I slunk out the side of the room in the dark and hoping that no one noticed me. And I walked out of, I walked out of the chapel and uh, went back to my cabin. And, and uh, it, it, this is not, it wasn't like my, my first rodeo. It's like I had done this so many times. It's spoken at so many retreats. But this one, I was so confused. Uh, I was so, I, I just didn't know what, what my thoughts were. And I was so, I was dealing with like disappointment and hurt and confusion. And I went back to my room and I think I just, you know, went to bed. <laughs> it was such a weird, bizarre experience. And uh, the next morning I actually had one last session. This is the last closing session. So I go out to this group of students. It's a big group. It's like about 100 students were there at this, mm. at this gathering. It's all, you know, college and so forth, college, high school. Um, and I remember I, I came out there and I felt so apologetic for the previous night that I, I literally, when it was my time to speak, I took the mic and I stood in front of this group of students and I began to, uh, I began to, to apologize to them. I said, if something I said last night was not from the heart of God, I'm so sorry. And I just began to sob in front of them. And they must have thought, this is the craziest speaker that I've ever seen before. Last night you're yelling at us. This night you're crying, asking for this. Forgive us, forgive you. And uh, I, uh, I left that retreat. I couldn't get out there fast enough. It was so funny as, as I was leaving, you know, everyone's, you know, saying goodbye and hugging each other. But when I walked out, it's like the, it's like the sea parting from Moses. Like everyone's like, get out of my way. You're getting out of my way. It's like, you know, oh my God, here he comes again. It's like, don't start crying on me again. And so I just went <laughs> straight to the car with my wife uh, who was there. My mom was there, which made even things worse, right? I don't know why she was at this retreat. I think she just wanted to visit and see what it was like. 
And um, I went from, <laughs> we went from there, it was in Riverside, California, and we drove up. We had planned a vacation to go camping in Lake Tahoe um, right after. So we drove all the way up, dropped my mom off in Sacramento, and went up to um, Tahoe, where it was the most beautiful place in the summertime. And uh, we're camping there in the most beautiful place uh, in, in the summer, and I was the most miserable person. I was so, I was just still trying to figure out what happened. I, I, I felt like I had heard God so clearly. Um, I felt like I, God had you know, spoken about what he was going to do. And I just felt tricked by God. I mm. felt like, wow, you, you deceived me. You, like, mm. you lied to me. You failed to come through. You, I, I, all these thoughts, I just didn't know how to process. And I was just so hurt. And, and um, I remember... It's like the second, third night, uh, we were camping in a tent, and um, I had two little, you know, my sons were, I had two sons at that time, and they were both little toddlers, but we were sleeping in the tent. In the middle of the night, I wake up, and I remember waking up, looking at the top of the tent in the, in the dark, and I hear a voice, and the voice says to me, if you tend to the pond from out of it, the river will flow. Mm -hmm. And then I see Isaiah 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And I remember just like, I, I open my eyes. And I'm looking at the tent. I don't know why I'm awake. And I hear, if you tend to the pond, from out of it, the river will flow. And then I see Isaiah 1, 1, 1. And I'm just sitting there. And I remember just literally thinking, what? Like, what does that mean? And I had absolutely no clue. I, I had no idea what that statement meant. I had no idea what Isaiah 111111 was. And I remember after being up for a while, I just went back to sleep, woke up the next morning, and I told my wife, I said, well, let's go down into town because I, I need to get a Bible. I didn't bring my Bible. I think I was so upset with God, I didn't want to read the Bible. <laughs> so I just left it at home. But we go down to go down into the town. I I had to actually go into a bookstore. I had to go back into the religion section and grab a Bible. And we're opening up Isaiah 111. And the verse is where God is saying, like, what are your sacrifices to me? Mm. They're meaningless. Mm -hmm. And then I, and it took me a little bit of time, but I remembered that the morning after that night, that, that you know, horrible night, and I was preparing for the last session, I was in my cabin, and this is at the retreat. That morning I woke up, and I remember, you know, getting out of bed and kneeling down beside the bed. And, and at that time, you know, we used iPods. And I remember I pressed shuffle on my iPod. And the song that came out, as I looked, the title came out, and it was Remember Mercy. And I remember opening my Bible just to do my, my daily reading. And I happened to fall in Matthew where Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees. And he's saying this to them, go and find out what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And it, it took me a while because I, I had to get over my hurt. But it took me a while to realize that what God was saying to me was that he was saying, son, I know how much you want revival. Mm -hmm. I know how much you're longing for a move and awakening. He said, but you're never going to get it by just preaching about it. You'll never see revival by just talking about the historical moves of God in the past. But if you will love my children, and if you will reveal to them my heart for them, and if you tend to the pond and care for it, then out of that, that pond, it's going to come a mighty river of revival. The thing that you're longing for, you're going to see. And, you know... When God woke me up in July and told me that he's going to give me a gift, he was, that was God. He gave me the greatest gift um, on the last night of that retreat. It came in a package I really would never, ever had wanted. It was a real uh, humiliating, horrible, confusing, painful gift. But it was what absolutely transformed my life. Because what God began to do was to 
he began to take my foundations and, and my whole understanding of who he was. Mm -hmm. And he began to like break up the foundation and began to rebuild it upon his love. I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a Christian home. My parents were pastors, but you know, I, I'm so thankful for my mom and dad and their faith. But you know, a, a lot of times the way that they would talk about God would be about a God who, um, you got to live right. And if you don't, man, he's going to, he's going to set you straight. You know, he's going to like discipline you hard and, and everything. And so they taught me how to fear God, but sometimes it was, you know, not the healthiest fear. And so I, I lived in this kind of, uh, uh, performance mentality. Mm -hmm. Like I had to perform. Um, I had to please God and I, I had to work and I had to earn and I had to strive. But what God was doing, and this was 18 years ago, it was actually um, 18 years ago. Uh, it happened in July, you know, August 18. But 18 years ago, God began to transform my understanding of who he was and who he is as a father. I mean, I knew he was a father and I knew that he was good, but I just didn't know how good of a father he really was. Mm -hmm. And he, he began to really transform my understanding of him, you know, from the foundation all the way up. And um, began to change not only the way I saw him, but then it began to change the way that I saw myself. And I said, God, if this is how good you are, and if this is how you see me, and how, how, how you, how you see me so wonderfully. And if those things are true, well, then what does that mean about all these other people? You know, the pierced ones, you know, the tatted ones, the, the purple-haired ones. What does it mean about those people, God? And I began to realize the depth of his love for the lost. And it began to change everything in my life. It changed everything in my relationship with him. It changed everything in my um, and even the way that I ministered to it changed even my understanding of the gospel. And, um, and uh, so it, it really was a gift that he gave me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that he taught me first was, um, he said, I, I, is it okay to just keep talking? Yeah. Like this? Yeah. One of the things he, he really began to help me to understand was that he said, I want you to, he said, I want you to look at the story of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. and I want you to look at it again. He said, because the story of the prodigal son um, was the clearest presentation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I began to read it again with, because I had, I had so much knowledge of God. I had mm -hmm. so much knowledge of the Bible, and I knew all the stories. And I heard it been preached and taught. But God began to, like, allow me to see it from a, a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I remember about the prodigal son, as I began to read it, I, uh, he began to really show me how he viewed us and how he viewed sin and, and what his wrath really looked like. I mean, I, I, I won't go through the whole story, but I rem you, know, if, if you're, you know, if you know the story uh, in Luke 15, you know, the son asks the father for his share of the inheritance, which is basically wishing his father, to, to, he can't wait for his dad to die. Right. And so he wants his money now. And it was such an, a horrible request to make. Um, uh, it was something that probably in, in, you know, in Middle Eastern culture would be deserving of death. Mm. But the amazing thing about it is that Jesus is telling us the story. And he says that the father gives it to the son what he asks for. And... Um, and, you know, God began to really show me the way that he looks at sin. And the way that God looks at sin is not the way that we think. Um, when we think about sin and we think about uh, it's something that offends God, violates his holiness, and something that fills him if we don't repent with wrath. But when we read that story, what we see the father doing to the son is giving him the thing that he wants. And what I began to realize is that God doesn't need to punish us for our sins. 
because sin punishes us all by itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of times we think like, you know, when we sin, we keep repeating, like, like God is so mad that he wants to just like, you know, discipline us for it. But what we don't realize is that the father, when he, when he sees us rebelling against him and uh, what he does in his wrath is not spank us, but he actually gives us the thing that he wants. I, I began to look through the Old Testament. And if you look through the story of the children of Israel, time and time and time and time again, like there's a cycle of what you know, theologians call the cycle of apostasy. And what happens is that the Israelites are redeemed by God, saved out of Egypt. But what they do is they rebel against God's ways. And so what God says and what God does when they don't repent, they continue uh, to, to do what's wicked and evil. God doesn't spank them. What he does is that he, he simply takes his protective covering in hand and he removes it mm -hmm. from them. And then because his protection is no longer there, all the, yeah. the foreigners, the Amalekites, the Jebusites, and all the Canaanites, whatever, they all come in and attack until they cry out to God and repent. And when they do, God brings his hand of protection over them. And I, I began to see, like, in, in the New Testament, even in, in Romans 1, it's like the, the, the favorite chapter that people like to use to talk about the wrath of God. You know, mm -hmm. there's the wrath of God has come. It's like we love to preach about the wrath of God to scare the hell out of sinners. Literally, the cell, the, the, scare the hell out of sinners. But if you read that, what Paul says is that, that the wrath of God has come and he begins to describe the sins and the sinners. And what, what he says is that because of their sinfulness, therefore God gave them over mm. to their sin. The way that God deals with our sin is not to punish us because of it, because he's offended or angered. But what God does is say, he says, listen, you really, really want that? You really want to keep doing that? Okay. Here you go. Mm. Have it. You really want your share of the inheritance. You really want to leave my house. Mm. Here, I give it to you. And so what happens is that we take our sin, and sin does a pretty good job. It just steals and it kills and it destroys us from within. It just robs us of our innocence, robs us mm -hmm. of, our, of, of our peace. It makes us fearful, not only of God, but of each other, right? Suspect, suspicious. Just like, you know, anxiety ridden. And sin does this job of destroying us from the inside. Yep. This, is, this is the wrath of God. And God began to show me, you, know, you want to know, this is my love for you. It's like, I'm not angry at you. I'm not angry at you even when you really mess up. It's like, even when you rebel against me, I'm not against you. But I'll, in my wrath, in my judgment on you, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the very thing you want. Because sin doesn't change God's, uh, it, you know, sin doesn't change the way God thinks about us. It, it, it's going to change the way we think about God. Mm -hmm. Sin will change the way I think about God, the way I think about other people, the way I think about myself. But it never changes the way God thinks about us. And so what God will do is give us and let us alone with our sin to let it do its work. And when we are ready to repent, like the sun, when we're ready to repent, God says, I'm going to be here for you. Just like that father who stood on the porch, it says that while his son was a long way off, that meant that the father was looking for his son on the horizon. He wasn't inside the house stewing in his anger and just like wringing his hands and thinking, oh, that boy, one day he comes home. It says that he was looking a long way off, and when he saw his son coming home, it says that he ran to him. And God began to show me, son, it's like you want to know how good and how far and how wide my love is. Mm. How f my love is not conditional. My forgiveness is not conditional upon your repentance. That the father had already forgiven the son before the son had even asked for or even deserved forgiveness. That son is on his way home, and he's thinking, 
He's looking at the pigs eating this pig slop, thinking, man, my father's servants eat better than this. He says, uh, he, goes, he, he, he decides, he comes to his senses, which is real repentance. Mm-hmm. That's the word metanoia in the New Testament. The word repent is this word metanoia. And most real respected theologians, biblical scholars, will always say that metanoia being defined and translated as repentance akin to Old Testament repentance is so short. It falls so short of what it really means. Mm. Metanoia means to not only change your attitude, but to change the very way you think about something. So what the boy is doing is that he changes his, his mind. He's like, what the heck am I doing? And he decides to go back. And so the amazing thing is that he's rehearsing in his mind. This is what I'm going to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. No, no, no. no. A little more emotional. Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. No, 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 no. Just be straight. I mean, he's thinking that his words and what he's going to say is going to change his father's heart without realizing that his father's heart never changed to begin with. The father never stopped loving his son. The father had forgiven him. Already, it's like to me, one of the things that God broke me is, is I remember the morning I was, I was preparing for you know, Easter Sunday and I'm reading about the, the, the crucifixion story. In the morning, I'm reading Jesus hanging on the cross and Jesus looking at his executioners and the ones who nailed them there. And he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. The reason why the Father can forgive us, the reason why the Father could forgive His Son is because we just don't know what we're doing. If we really knew what sin was and what it did to us and how it killed and stealed and destroyed our lives and everyone around us, we would never touch it. But the reason why God could always, He has, it's forgiveness is not conditional. The Father doesn't need us to forgive us. He already forgives us because He knows He knows that we don't know what we're doing. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that, I, 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 you know, even my theology, I used to teach like, you know, on the cross as Jesus was bearing the sins of the world, that the Father in His holiness turned away from the Son because He was too holy, seeing the sins of the world on Him. And God began to say, is that really who I am? Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. Jesus ate and dwelt with the sinners. It was the Pharisees who couldn't look upon the sinners or their sin. But Jesus dwelt and ate and loved with the sinners. And so on the cross, Paul redefines, he helps us understand, he says that on the cross, that Jesus, that God was in Christ Jesus on the cross, reconciling the world back to him. He wasn't reconciling himself back to the people. It wasn't like God was like, I got to get over my anger. All right, Jesus, now that I've like got all my wrath out on you on the cross, I can now reconcile myself back to the world. No, Paul says that God was in Christ. The father was one with the son. They were in complete union. He was in Christ, reconciling the world back to him, not counting their sins against them. And so as I began to realize this, I said, God, your goodness is so far. When I say you're good, it's not you're good when I'm good. No, you're good even when I'm bad. And even if I keep being bad, you're still good. And nothing about you ever changes your heart towards me. It absolutely began to transform my life. The father forgave the son and ran out while the son was thinking, these are the words that will win my father's heart. And the father ran out, picks him up, twirls him around, tells his servants to kill the fatted calf, bring a ring, my ring, and put it on his finger. Bring my robe and put it on him for my son that was lost is alive. I just began to realize that, God, you're, you, you love me more than I'll ever, ever really understand. I'll never, ever be able to comprehend this. But this is what I mean. Like, it, it began this, it's, it's been an 18-year journey for me, like, where God had to, like, rewire all of my understanding of who he is 
and how he sees me and, and then how he sees the world. So when I look at the world, I don't look at them with the eyes like God is going to just judge the world. We, you know, it's so amazing that we hold the world to a standard of only those that really know God. How can we expect them to really live righteously when they have not meant the true righteous one? No. Judgment begins in the church. You know, it's like the church needs to really face the judgment. No. We need to judge ourselves before we go judge in the world. Mm -hmm. And so this is for me, it began, it transformed my relationship with God, it began to transform my relationship with the world, even the way that I administer and how I felt like we were to go. And um, it's just been an amazing journey. And it's one that I'm, I'm still on, you know, and, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful. You know, he, he told me, I'm going to give you a gift. And it was probably the, the ugliest gift I'd ever received. But inside the packaging was just something that was so beautiful. And uh, absolutely, you know, it's transformed my life. And so Interesting. On the inside, it's the best gift ever. But of course, on the outside, it's the ugliest gift. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Lord judges the heart yeah. uh, on the external. So the first time when you encounter him, as you were driving back to Sacramento, yeah. after you left your friend's place, what was the difference between the first time versus 18 years ago? Like, did you meditate on that? Did you ask the Lord the difference, the two encounters, how he have taught you and continue to teach you to this day? I mean, I, I think like the way that we encounter God, um, I mean, if we could put a visual image to it, it probably looks like, you know, we're going in circles, but we're not just simply going in circles. We're going, we're going up mm. and we're just going up higher. And so at times God will, will, will come back to encountering the love of God. And I encountered the love of God on that freeway. I'd never experienced anything like that in 20 years of my life. I, but when I encountered his love uh, years later, it, it was, it was a, a revelation of mm. his, not only of his love, like I know he's a, he's a God who loves, but I realized how far that love was willing to go yeah. and how unconditional that love was and how much that love extended beyond just me or the people inside the church or the religious ones or the people who acted good. His love extended to the worst of the sinners yeah. and in their darkest of their hearts. Uh, and so it wasn't like it was a, a, a different kind of love. It was just a, an understanding of how wide and how deep and how long, you know, how is the love of Christ that it's a love that surpasses knowledge, you know, as the yes. scripture says. And so, yeah, so I, I, um, I never saw it like as a contrast. I just saw it as a, like a, an, another layer, another depth of how great his love is. And that's my journey right now to know mm. how far and how wide, and how deep, and how long is the love. Isn't it beautiful that his words say in the Bible, you know, the death and the width and the height of my love. Yeah is unsearchable yeah. because we cannot measure his love. Exactly. We yeah. think that we know, yeah. but we cannot. Yeah. I mean, it's un unsearchable. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even try to search and yeah. measure his love. Yeah. Or even his understanding is unsearchable. Yeah. We, you mentioned earlier when he gave you the package and later on he revealed to you, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In my heart right now, I, I, I have this... This, I don't want to use the word feeling, but an impression where a lot of churches now, they're focused more on sacrifice instead of mercy. Yeah. Well, if I can kind of, I know like the way he spoke that to my heart was a little different because what I felt God saying through that, I know that we typically define that as I desire you to show mercy mm -hmm. and not to give sacrifice. But when God spoke that, to me, what he said to me was that I desire to show you mercy. 
and not for you to give me sacrifice. Mm. So, so much of what we do is what we offer to God, what we can do for God mm. and how we can meet his requirements. But what mm. God was saying, son, there's nothing that you can do. There's no nothing that you can do that will ever be enough. I desire to show you mercy and not for you to give me sacrifice. And anything that comes out of you is going to come out of the overflow. Wow. It's, that's the way it's always supposed to be. That's what, that's what Jesus came to show. Yeah. Your righteous deeds are like filthy, filthy rags. rags. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus came to show is like, listen, all the Israelites and all the cycles of apostasy that they went through was to show us one thing is that you could try as hard as you want to be good, but there's no one that's righteous. And then everything that we do, whatever good that comes out of me, it's not going to be, it's never supposed to be out of my effort. It's never supposed to be out of my trying harder. It's supposed to come out of the overflow mm -hmm. of his love, empowered by the Holy Spirit to love the lost, to love the world, to love myself. And so he said, I just want you to live receiving just that's why Paul says like, to, to, it's like, I want to mm -hmm. know Christ. That mm -hmm. was it. It's like, I just need to know more of him. Mm -hmm. I, I was just, you know, just a second ago when you're talking, I was thinking about, you know, the apostle John, who was the oldest living of the disciples. And when you read his letters, you read his gospels later than all the other Matthew, Mark, and Luke, his letters, first, second, third, John, were written by an old man. Revelation was written by an old man. But when you read his letters, if, if you, I began to look at them again and realize that the overwhelming theme of his letters is love. all about the love. Amen. It's like to walk in love. Yeah. It's that no one who doesn't, you know, who knows God, you know, uh, will continue to sin, but will to continue to love. It's like, it's all about loving one another. <laughs> Because here's a man that walked with God for many, 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 many years. And the wisdom of an old man who's had a, a long journey with God was that, listen, this is what it's all about. Yeah. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us first. And so I, I realized, like, wow, this is, this is really what it's all about. So it, it changed, like, you know, everything in my perspective of how to live in my journey with God about not my efforts, not my sacrifices, not my, uh, all my works, but about just living in his mercy and his grace and his love for me um, and, and just being overwhelmed by that. So that's, that's like my prayer. It's like, you know, for me is to know and grow in the depth and knowledge of who he is and his love for me. Amen. That's why Jesus said, what the two greatest commandments. Yeah. Yeah. If we just follow that, then we can hang up all the laws yeah, and the prophets. Exactly. As a, we don't need, like you it. said, to do try hard to please him because nothing can please him exactly. except just to receive. Yeah. And something that I learned recently that in the Word of God, in the Bible, and I need to correct myself to remind myself, is we cannot say that we get saved, right? We received him yeah. into our lives. Yeah. And he transforms us. Yeah. Yeah. We did not get him. Yeah. He's always here. Yeah. But we receive him in, into our hearts. Yeah. And that was a revelation for me as well. Wow. Is to receive his love. Yeah. Until we receive his love and that he's in us. That, that's the reason why he said what we must abide in him and he's in us. Yeah. But if we don't abide in him Absolutely. and he's not in us, how are we going to receive his love and experience his love and there, therefore love others if yeah. we can't receive but don't receive his agape love. Like, wow, Lord, That's ex revelation so good. from Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because abide in me. Abide in me and I yeah. in you. Yeah. That yeah. is so beautiful. So my question is, does it help? I mean, the That's last... the gospel, really. Amen. <laughs> I mean, that, that's Come good up. news. I Amen. mean, we really, we often forget that the gospel means good news. And sometimes our good news sounds like bad news. God's angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> Repent or you're going to go to hell. And like, thank God, that's good news. No, that sounds like bad news. <laughs> and like, uh, initially it sounds like bad news. So the it's... good news is that God loves you. He's always Amen. loved you. No matter, no matter no what, matter he what. will always still love you. And God's not your enemy. Sin's your enemy. The devil's yeah. your enemy. Yeah. And uh, he's come. <laughs> Jesus has come to save you from the works and destroy the works of the devil. That's, that's good news. 
that reminds me. really the gospel. <laughs> so true. And when we go out and we share the good news to the lost, the broken, yeah. we cannot have this wrath message or yeah. this unhappy yeah. fear of the world yeah. message. But something I just learned recently from T.L. Osborne yeah. um, through the Christ Connection series that I just finished studying is that, you know, just love on them and don't judge anyone and just come share the good news with a happy face, not yeah. like yeah. a sad, tragic face. Like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. a really good, you know, good It's thing the Holy to take. Spirit's job to convict the world of their sin, Amen. righteousness, and judgment, not ours. I mean, we're, we're called to present the good news. If we are going to judge, it's to judge people within the church. Mm. <laughs> we're called to confront one another in love, speak the truth in love. Mm. And we can sit there and confront one another. But, you know, uh, even Paul, like, you know, says it, when you, I judge this man, and even his judgment is like God's. Kick him out of the community. Mm. Give him what he wants. Let him out in the world. Let him cut him loose. That's the judgment of God. It's not like uh, let's you know really like come down hard on this guy. It's like no, give him what he wants, because that's our judgment. And so if we are called to judge, it's to judge ourselves, and um, and to judge one you know our community, but to do it in love and truth. But to leave you know the, to, the message for the world. Is, is to bring them good news of a loving and a good God that sent his only son. Since the second encounter with the Lord 18 years ago, and you, every day, the Holy Spirit revealed the revelation of Christ to you, how is your walk or your relationship with your family, your wife, your sons has been since? Well, I mean, it really... Uh, I, I think the whole, since the 18 years, it was about, it, it took a while, you know, and it's taking a while for me to really get it into me. You know, you, sometimes you got to kind of like, um, <laughs> one of the things we talk about here is like, you know, sometimes spiritual growth is not a matter of addition, it's subtraction, you know. Sometimes it's not about like just adding more knowledge. Sometimes we actually have to take out bad stuff. And, and that's how we grow. And for a long time, I had to really, um, I had to take out a lot of the stuff, the wrong thinking in me. And, um, and um, a lot of my processing was like with my church, just like kind of speaking and sharing. But, you know, I got to a point where I, I, I kind of thought, like, I really understand this and I really get it, you know. Um, but God brought, without going into too many details for the sake of my family, but God brought us, our family, through a really, uh, a really challenging season. And, uh, it was, it was the darkest season of, uh, of our lives. I'd never ex imagined even my worst nightmare that it could become like it did, uh, and this is only like five, six, seven years ago. And um, it, was, it was in that, in that season where, where God was, um, I didn't really realize it until afterwards, but the very thing that I was teaching about the love of the Father and how far his love is willing to go, um, God was saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take you through this because I'm going to make this truth not just something that you know, but I'm going to make it something that is just so worked into you that it's going to become uh, embedded into the very fabric of who you are. Mm. And so he did that, and he took us through a really dark time, but it was about how far and how wide and how deep will a father's love go. Um, my love, you know, how far will it go? And um, it was never about me. It was always, it was never about like how much I could love, but God's love coming through me and working in me for the sake of my family. And, um, you know, we're on, the, we're on the other side of that, you know, thankfully. <laughs> it was a really dark season. We're on the, and we're in a season of an amazing... Uh, restoration and um, 
and uh, I could really, I, I, uh, I feel like I knew the message in my mind, but I really, I, I now, like, I have it in me. It's, it's who I am. I think, you know, authority comes for whatever we have to fight for and fight through. Mm. And whatever we are able to come through, we gain authority in that area. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that God said, I don't want you to just teach us. I want you to embody it and have authority in it. And so that's what the last five years have been about. Five, seven years have been about. About God really working this so deep into my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I, I um, it's just part of who I am now. This this, the depth and the width and the knowledge. And even still, I just feel like I'm just, I've only s scratched the surface of how good your love is, God. But I, I know it's way more than what I believed before. And um, so that's, that's pretty much where that brings us up to date right now. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, there's a whole lot more you know, to that. It was an incredible, amazing process. God is... I'll just say that in his restoring process, he is so kind. Mm -hmm. um, and he does things even though he doesn't have to. Yeah. But he is so good and so kind. And I've been like shocked by his kindness towards me. Um, things that I kind of like said, you don't, I'm okay with that. And you don't need to uh, explain that to me. He would come and, 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 uh, reveal things to me uh, and uh, it would just floor me with how kind he is. Mm -hmm. It's like you're so good and so kind to me and um, thank you. So yeah, that's, that's kind of like what's been happening lately. As you were sharing, I have this image of you're a father of three sons and you definitely love your three sons unconditional. So he's just showing like just a scratch of his love. Yeah. I just sensed that in my spirit the other day as I was just spending time with him. And I sensed that if he was to show more at once, I, I think I would just fall down and die. Because we can't comprehend. Our heart yeah. would burst and yeah. we would just be gone. Yeah. Of his love yeah. and his loving kindness and his, his grace and his mercy. And when, he's, when, when he said to Paul that my grace is sufficient, yeah. I just said, Lord, your grace is beyond sufficient. <laughs> it's more than that. Yeah. It, it's, we, can't, we can't even measure his grace. Yeah. You know, as you were sharing, it's just, he's just reminding that how much he loves his children, all of us, yeah. everyone. Yeah. But are we going to receive his love? Yeah into our heart? Are we going to open our hearts and say, Lord, come and, you know, have your way in me? Yeah. I mean, or are we going to just walk away and say, well, I'll come back to you when I need you. Let me do this thing on my own first, like the prodigal son that mm -hmm. you were sharing. And it's just like the, that message, I, I just sense that that's what he wants everyone to know, even the most wicked or sinful or lost and broken. He just wants them to come to him. And rest in him and receive yeah. his love. Yeah. Only his love can change and yeah. transform the heart of man. What is your message that you have for those who haven't truly experienced God yet? Well, what, what would I say to them? What is your message? Those are still, whether lost in the world or those still working, serving the Lord. But like you, you, had, you went through that season. Yeah. You thought you'd serve him well. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, what I would what I would have to say to them is everything that I that I have said is that um, God is so kind, and He um, He is so good beyond what we can understand. And um, I mean, that's just a very generic sounding message, but I would I would um, I would say whatever situation that they're in, no matter how uh, despicable or despised of God they feel that they are and undeserving of his love that they feel, I would say that God 
loves them even in their darkest moment. And I would, I would tell people um, to not run away from God, but to run to him and let him love the darkness out of you. It's this, dark, it's this love that just really, we don't need to get rid of our darkness to come to God. Yeah. Uh, it's his kindness that leads to repentance. And um, we often switch that, you know, there's repentance that will lead to his kindness. <laughs> Repent and God will be kind to you. But no, it's, his, it's like when God has kind of shocked me with how kind and good and loving he is towards me, gracious and merciful. Oh man, it, it just really ruins and wrecks me. And that's where like, I really began to say, I think that son, the prodigal son, I think when his father really loved him, I think that's when he really, really, knew what he had done and how um, I think that's where he really probably repented really genuinely with his heart. And because um, it was the kindness of his father that led to that. 